All right, joining me now from London is Elisa de Carbonell, who is the deputy director of the International Crisis Group and a former journalist who covered Russia from Moscow. Hi, Elisa. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time to, to talk. And when were you, first of all, a journalist in, in Russia? You were based in Moscow, right? Yeah, I was uh, started out at the Moscow Times, gosh, now in the 2006, 2007, um, and then was through for a very long time, through the beginning of the Ukraine war. So, so now you have the news, and I always like to start with a bit of the news of the day, that Russia has just expelled the political uh, European correspondent and former Moscow Times editor-in-chief, Eva Hartog. Uh, Hartog, if, excuse me if I'm not saying it right. Um, her visa is not going to be extended. She's been given six days to leave Russia. There is like this pattern, obviously, of stifling dissent inside Russia. Um, but these um, visa cancellations are a bit puzzling because generally they, the, the Kremlin doesn't tend to care what foreign press says that much. Uh, except in the case of the Wall Street Journal, Evan uh, Gershkovich, who was arrested on an espionage charge and remains in jail. What, what's your reaction to this visa cancellation? So I don't know um, that, I mean, it used to be true that definitely um, Moscow didn't care about uh, publications that had a low circulation or were for a Western audience. And I think that really has changed in recent years. Um, you know, we've seen the crackdown on, on Russian publications. We've seen um, what's happened in terms of really escalating, you know, to to name uh, Dost and other channels. Um, so anybody who talks to them can, you know, be considered criminal in, in, in Russia. Um, so, you know, I think that's in line with that. There's a real desire to control the narrative around the war in Ukraine. Um, there's, you know, the, the arrest of uh, um, a Western journalist was something unthinkable when you and I were based in Moscow. And now, you know, it, it seems like a risk that other journalists aren't willing to take. And, yeah. and, and, and we should say b behind the scenes, a lot of people have just left, uh, you know, just pulling out of the uh, out of the air I can say the New York Times for instance got out of Dodge a while ago um, and there are a lot of foreign journalists who have simply left the country for fear of arrest um, and other journalists are going in and out very carefully and not traveling the country as much because they're they're scared of what the Kremlin might do yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just met up with some former Moscow-based correspondents in London, and we were counting on our hands, um, you know, how many uh, Anglophone journalists were still based in Moscow. Will you talk about also the, you know, I want to lead you towards the grain uh, deal that Russia has now backed out of. But overnight, I mean, Russia is pounding Odessa again uh, and ports along the Danube. Um, what are they trying to do? They, they're trying to degrade Ukraine's ability to export grain, obviously. Is this just part of, of the war and we'll just see more and more of this? Or do you think that they're going to have the ability to completely cripple Ukraine's ability to export food to the world? You know, so that is a question. Uh, Ukraine is trying very hard to find other routes. Um, I think this morning, you know, um, and today, people are really watching the progress of a Hong Kong flagged vessel that has left uh, Black Sea port and, and is making its way in territorial waters um, along Romania to try to, to get out and kind of uh, forge this new uh, humanitarian corridor, as Ukraine has called it, but that's a really risky proposition, and there's lots of potential for escalation there, um, and it's very unclear what what will happen. Uh, I think there are a lot of commercially minded, uh, you know, insurance companies and others who are not going to want to take that risk. What is Moscow trying to do? I mean, it's trying to do what it um, has done since the beginning of the conflict. Um, it was attacking agricultural um, infrastructure, farms, um, taking wheat and grain at the very beginning, um, you know, post the, the large scale invasion. 
And now there was a sort of a pause. I mean, I tend to see the Black Sea grain deal as an anomaly of sorts. Um, now it's really focused on squeezing Ukraine's economy. Agriculture is one of those bedrocks and it's become a target once again. I think it's really reaching for all ways in which to put pressure on Ukraine at this time when it's, uh, you know, it's really become sort of a war of attrition in many senses. Um, so perhaps it cares less about what the international community thinks at this point. Um, it was dissatisfied with the Black Sea grain deal for quite a while um, and already um, there, you know, the market initially didn't react so strongly because um, it was sort of expected that Russia wasn't going to continue in the deal. Um, but with these airstrikes, we've really seen its intentions much more clearly. Degrade the economy to what end? You know, we've seen actually Russian officials kind of make comments about, um, you know, Ukraine's ability to fight. Uh, people are leaving. Um, the agriculture sector is one of the most important to Ukraine's economy. Um, it's already been really drastically reduced um, in scale and size. You know, there's mines scattered across the country. A big chunk of the country um, cannot continue production. But the goal is really to undermine Ukraine's ability to fight, um, its morale, um, its viability as a state for the future. I mean, it's really seems to be Putin's goal. Not only Ukraine, but along the Danube. I mean, you have Russia saying that NATO um, should should leave other other countries. Um, uh, you, you know, threatening to expand the war. Um, and you know, how much of this? How much of this is propaganda uh, to scare the West, or and how much of it is is serious intent? Uh, to for, you know, for Putin to restore the the former Soviet near abroad, and and it's and I I understand you won't have an answer to it, but you have to take it all pretty seriously considering they they have invaded Ukraine, the war goes on, and they are trying to push further. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, it's an interesting, we're talking about the grain deal and the, the missile strike on, um, you know, Danube, uh, along the Danube near Romania was really very, very close to Romania. That was a shock. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, it, it's a sort of a wake up call among many about the escalatory potential of this conflict. Um, Ukraine's Western backers are very much dancing this line and this balancing act of not wanting to escalate into a NATO-Russia conflict, um, but still providing Ukraine weapons and um, signals, you know, you saw at the NATO summit that they were going to continue this support long term, short of NATO accession, you know, there will be bilateral deals from Western backers who will promise uh, a, a certain amount of continued aid, and that's one way in which they're seeking to give sort of security guarantees to Ukraine. Um, but Russia obviously is now saying that it's going to try to, you know, discourage that. Um, and some officials have linked missile strikes as retaliation for, you know, announcements of weapon supplies or weapon supplies. It's really, um, you know, it's a very dangerous situation. We have Polish troops now on the Belarus Belarusian border because of, um, you know, Wagner um, moving there. So, this is this is always one of the things we at Crisis Group are very intent in watching um, and cautioning against. Do you think that the war is not going as well as as people who support Ukraine would would like to say? So you have you have Stian Jensen, the chief of staff to NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg, saying at an event on in in Norway on Tuesday, and I just read this this morning. That while any peace would have to be acceptable to Ukraine, alliance members are discussing how the 18-month war might be brought to an end. Quote, I think a solution could be for Ukraine to give up territory and get NATO membership in return. Now, that, that has angered Ukraine that he came out and said that. But obviously, there's somebody at a, a high-ranking position in NATO saying, yeah, territorial compromise. How do we get the shooting stopped? Maybe we give... Russia, some of the lands that they've now invaded and occupy. Yeah, it's it's interesting you picked up on that. That definitely made waves. And it's the kind of thing that um, I would say Western officials are more 
um, the kinds of conversations they want to have in private and not in public um, in events. Um, the counteroffensive itself had a lot of uh, stakes uh, attached to it. Um, it begun in June, and it's so far disappointed expectations, and those expectations were really high, right? Um, Ukrainian and Western partners have been touting the counteroffensive for, you know, months, um, and they thought, you know, the best case scenario was that they were going to break through Russian lines towards Melitopol and, and kind of split um, Russian troops. That might have been overly ambitious. Um, in any case, now there's a bit of a blame game going on. But I, I mean, I, I to come back to, you know, the second part of your question, I think, you know, one of the stakes for Ukraine was to stave off any uh, discussion or sort of uh, suggestions by Western backers that the situation is a stalemate, that there will not be any big transfer of land between the two sides, and therefore Ukraine should sit down um, and talk about different and explore different kinds of compromises. That is one view. It is definitely probably not the dominant view. Um, there are different threat perceptions still in the West about uh, Russia, um, the best ways of deterring Russia long term, the best ways of supporting Ukraine. But certainly um, that the counteroffensive hasn't been as successful as people were expecting or wanting it to be. Um, opens up more room for this kind of blame game and for this kind of debate about well, what. Let me, before I before mm -hmm. I ask a few questions attached to that, are mm -hmm. we too are we too early? I mean, journalists tend to have short attention spans, and it is August sixteenth now. Um, is it too early to say that the counteroffensive has, you know, not failed or or has not been a grand success? Um, or do you think that we may see a breakthrough, uh, you know, sometime this summer where they're able to try and pinch that land bridge to Crimea? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I do think it's too early. There's a lot of tight operational security around what decisions Ukraine is going to make, but it is also going to make decisions based on, you know, how the fighting has gone so far. So it is adapting. There have been various phases. And the, the first phases and the first attempts have been very, very costly because, you know, the ground is littered by mines, because the Russians dug in, because um, they have helicopter power, and then you have a lot of debate among military analysts and, um, and, and generals about what Ukraine is missing, why is that the case, this is the little bit of the blame game that I'm talking about, but you also have debate within Ukraine about what the right thing to do going forward is, um, you know, not in public, but um, do they just uh, stop? at this point, cut their losses, prepare the grid, prepare for the winter, prepare for the fall, or do they push forward and really they they're fighting along three axes now. And there's been some you know, positive news um, actually just in the last days. So is there still an opportunity for them to sort of thrust forward along one of these axes and try to make a big push? It's a, you know, that might be very, very costly. And I think that's a decision perhaps that hasn't even been made yet risk versus reward on the on the battlefield and Ukraine has to at least stop Russia from taking more territory and that's a fear too right you know, how much how much do you expend in trying to retake these occupied areas but again you you know you come back to this debate um by people like you know uh, former uh, US army commander Ben Hodges um you know and and many people on that side who say look what you know we've the Biden administration's gone halfway there are still no attackums on the ground. There are still no F-16s in the air. And if you want to really see Ukraine be victorious, uh, you've got to up the risk level. Um, and with that danger that you spoke about when we started the interview about, you know, a possible sp a spread of the war, um, and but at least give Ukraine, you know, a, a bigger fighting fist so that they're able to take that take that land. Otherwise, why why has the West come so far to see just to see failure? I mean, I think that's exactly right. On the one hand, let's say the counteroffensive still, you know, 
um, doesn't make a huge thrust and push through and make huge territorial gains before the end of October. We've really, it's too early to say, we don't know what's going to happen in the coming days. But it could do two things. It could galvanize support, as you're suggesting, and 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 there will, could be a um, a discussion in the West that, you know, we've seen more pledges from the Biden administration just last week. Um, there could be a discussion that Ukraine really does need more support now um, to really stay the line, continue, you know, in its 18 months more, you know, uh, keeping Russia at bay, um, especially ahead of probably a difficult period in the winter and spring. Or you'll have the people who say, okay, this is this is where the war is at now. Uh, should we rethink? Um, were these the right weapons? Is the mix of NATO, Soviet sort of um, strategy and weaponry for the military working? Do they have enough training? Are they able um, to fight this fight? Um, so that's 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 the debate, the extreme well, ends of the debate. Oh, and and if you follow that chain of thinking at a certain point you know the political season is underway in america that that's for sure um let's not go there but you know the the biden's position for supporting ukraine may weaken um as americans increasingly debate and and look at the money uh that is going towards ukraine and i can tell you the headlines in the newspapers in florida where i am this week is why are they giving all this money to ukraine and biden has done nothing for hawaii and for the homes that that uh, were burned down so it is a real it is a real debate here and so you know sooner than later what would a solution look like right now because to 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 talk about peace seems ridiculous in many people's um, view, but to, sorry to make my question even longer. If you take a look at the the anniversary of North and South Korea, the armistice, you know a lot of parallels have been drawn there, where you would simply say, "Okay, fighting stops, uh, draw a line, everybody back up two kilometers, um, and we'll deal with this in ten years when Putin's dead." Um, you know, or, or or fifteen years, but in the meantime, draw an armist a, a, an armistice line and just get the fighting stopped. There'll be no peace treaty, uh, but it will be an end to hostility. So, it's very very difficult because you pointed out um, it's even too early to say about the counteroffensive. But I don't think that's the end of the appetite on both sides um, to continue fighting. Um, to be in the best position to perhaps even consider what a negotiation would look like. When people in Western capitals say Ukraine has to be at the forefront of it, that's that's not just rhetoric, I think. Um, there is a real risk that any kind of discussions about a ceasefire with um, Russia on the other side of the table who believes that uh, Ukraine is coming into the discussions because the West has pushed them into it and they're you know not at all ready for any kind of concessions or real dialogue plus uh, potentially just looking for a way to pause the fighting regroup and um, you know uh, enter a new phase. I think it's very difficult to consider those kinds of conversations mm -hmm. with um, with a counterparty who is signaling in every way possible, um, whether that's true or not, and I tend to think it is true, that they want to have a long war, that they are pre prepared to continue this fight um, above and beyond. I mean, even just Russia doesn't control the territories that it's officially annexed. Um, so it's hard to believe that it would be willing to sit down and discuss a ceasefire along the lines that are currently on the ground today. It's a way around. I mean, uh, it, it's a very long discussion what a peace would look like, but yeah. I think it's it's really not quite ripe yet for that conversation. I would say. I mean, it it may be more rhetoric uh, than than we give the situation credit, and that is everybody comes back to this what has become a cliche that. So I'm I'm going to take I'm going to take be devil's advocate here a little bit with you is that. Uh, you can't have any kind of settlement without Ukraine. 
And it's up to Ukraine to determine how long they want to fight on. And it's up to Ukraine to determine how this ends to a degree with, with Russia, obviously, as a, as, a, as a partner. It takes two to fight. But if America gets tired um, and France and Germany really lead the EU, and Britain's another discussion, but if they say that that's it, we're putting the brakes on, this is too costly and it's taking us nowhere, and the counteroffensive is just a is a grind that is not moving the lines anywhere. Ukraine will have a very hard time continuing the fight without their support, and they will, in effect, while politically say that they're not imposing any kind of armistice or peace deal or ceasefire. Um, in fa in fact, if they if their positions weaken in their support for the war, uh, it it will in in effect just lead to that. Do, do you not agree? So I think, um, you know, you point out one of the big reasons that this is a bit of a waiting game, right? Um, everybody is looking and worrying about where the U.S. elections go. That's, you know, that's the, you point out that this is part of the debate already. Um, and when campaigning really gets underway, people will worry about um, in Ukraine and cheer for it in Russia, um, perhaps a weakening of Western support. Right. We're not there yet. Well, and we all know we all know that Donald Trump says he can solve the conflict in 24 hours. Yeah, you know, I will say one thing about Trump and that is a little bit uh, counterintuitive and not uh, not uh, how people usually talk about his uh, relationship for all his touted uh, relationship with Putin. He also established ties with Poland. Um, you know, he was establishing ties with Hungary. He was selling LNG to Poland at a time when Russia was really unhappy about that. There were, you know, some contradictions in U.S. policy under Trump um, towards Russia um, overall. Okay. So let's hope that there, <laughs> that you know, this will support for Ukraine is definitely going to be front and center. I think you know better than me during the U.S. electoral campaign, but it will not be the only issue. Um, so it's it's we have to wait to see how that develops. But you know, to get back to your question, I think the risk is not that in the threat perceptions in the West, a lot of people understand that Ukraine is a bigger you know the stakes in Ukraine about you know long term European security. So if Russia is allowed to somehow emerge victorious or somehow um, seize territory, freeze it, uh, declare itself a victor, um, perceive it, what's next? And, that, that's and, it, the and it will be a huge victory for President Putin if he's able to hold what he's taken in Ukraine, however wobbly it is. And no, without any question, the Kremlin will declare a massive victory. And that's a world, um, a Russia that looks like that and a Putin with that kind of victory is not necessarily something any U.S. president wants to uh, be faced with long term. So this fight is about Ukraine, but it's about more than just Ukraine. Um, it's about deterring Russia in some way. Okay, two quick questions. And you've been very generous with your time. Um, and I'll try to make my questions a bit quicker today. The, at the end of the interview, I mean, um, I was reading an article on uh, or an analysis that that given the fact it is so hard to kick Russia out of the territories that they've taken in eastern Ukraine, NATO really has to take the position now of defense by denial. This old NATO idea that if Russia invades, uh, you can come in and kick them out in two or three days or a week, um, now has dr dramatically changed the war planning in NATO, and they can never allow Russia to advance into any of, of the uh, eastern borders with Russia. De so from defense the Russians... by denial, defense by denial, that NATO's pre-positioning and forward positioning uh, has to be you know, really go back to Cold War days where they're able to stop an advancing Russian army um, in, in Moldova, in the Baltics, uh, mm -hmm. that it's yeah, I mean, NATO's philosophy. Yeah, I mean, I think this, uh, even before um, Russia's full-scale invasion, you know, in, in, in February last year, NATO was, its whole raison d'etre was really about Russia and deterring Russia. It had, you know, um, since the Georgia conflict on, 
but now you really see that planning accelerated. I mean, that there was already planning about how do you get, uh, how do you coordinate things as technical as how do you get tanks from one country to the, to the Eastern border of another from, I don't know, France or wherever, how do you make sure the railways allow for this kind of full scale response? I mean, that planning has always been there. It's definitely, uh, multiplied, accelerated. I mean, we have new NATO members, we have discussions of, and you are absolutely right. Whatever kind of discussion is going to happen um, in in the days in which either side is at all ready to um, come to the table or even in advance of that planning, security guarantees are going to have to include Moldova. They're going to have to include Ukraine, uh, Georgia and Ukraine in ways that, um, you know, this kind of NATO's role in uh, a wider security architecture that um, might be sustainable and might deter Russia long term is going to have to be very, very different. And probably, you know, I don't have enough experience uh, studying NATO's positioning in the Cold War, honestly, to say how much that would resemble that. But I think we're in a very different world today. I think we've moved past that even. Is President Putin going to survive? You, you're seeing the ruble punch up over, uh, you know, 100 rubles now to the dollar. When you when you and I were based in Moscow, I, I, you know, when I was there, it was six. And then it kind of floated to eight. I mean, the economy is obviously suffering and things are getting tougher. Um, some people living in Russia tell me it's not that bad. But I mean, there are signs. The squeeze is on. Uh, in terms of the sanctions and, the, and the, the deeper bite that they're taking, is is any of this pushing back on Putin's popularity, and will he survive? Or do you think that um, his foundation is very wobbly right now, given what happened with Prigozhin and Wagner and all of the talk inside Russia, how long this war is going on, what the goals are, where do we go? Wow, that's a million dollar question. So. To start with the it's ruble, the million ruble question. With the million ruble question, yeah. So <laughs> I mean, the ruble is worth less than a solitary cent. I mean, it's quite striking, right? <laughs> um, the the situation with the ruble is obviously about the way that the sanctions, uh, the economy has transitioned and tra tra been transformed by the war. On the one hand, it shows that. Um, the efforts of an oil price cap um, are working. Um, it shows a decreased revenue for Russia from exports, and it shows an increase of imports, um, which tells you that Russia is buying probably to um, fund its war effort in different ways. We know that it's you know seeking and acquiring uh, different technologies and different elements of what it needs to, to keep the war effort going um, through despite sanctions. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the interesting story with the ruble, how people are going to react to it. I mean, people will be disappointed, um, but we've seen people weather a lot of things. And, and I would tend to say that, I mean, the polling that we've seen shows, and it's, you know, with, a huge grain of salt, right? Because polling in Russia is a very difficult thing to do right now. But there is support for Putin and there is a lot of anger at the West. So again, you know, when uh, Ukraine reaches for things like um, asymmetric drone strikes on Moscow um, to try to bring this conflict to Moscow, to try to um, show uh, the Russian public that they are also vulnerable, that from what I've heard from from sources and friends, um, you know, who who are in Russia or still working in Russia, they that people get used to that quite quickly. Um, so then you have all the questions about, and, and, and some of them yes. then reach out and hold even tighter to this idea that President Putin is going to save him, that he's the only guy. Uh, it it may galvanize support for the war rather than the the reverse, right? Exactly. And I mean, you you have a long history of reporting in Russia. Um, I tend to think that people are too quick to imagine a popular revolt or people turning against, uh, you know, Putin or to 
I don't know, maybe uh, hope for that. Um, I don't think that there is a full support behind this conflict, but um, it's people, the Wagner mutiny didn't, it raised for the Russian elite, the question of what comes next after Putin, but I wouldn't say for the Russian public. So the question is, you know, oh, do the business elite really have any role in saying anything? You know, uh, interesting, we were talking about the counteroffensive, but there's been a whole crackdown, you know, after the Wagner mutiny and, um, and Putin, you know, is trying to and has re-exerted control. So Surovikin, whose famous line, Ukraine cannot um, breach at the moment in their counteroffensive is disappeared um, under house arrest. We don't know what's going to happen with him. So there has been a response to that. This was the Russia. this was the general who was, for people don't know, was yes. good buddies with uh, Wagner's Prigozhin and although he did come up with a statement that day with a gun on his on his knees saying you know call off the counter of, call, call off the march on moscow yes thank you for that and the surovikin line is is really the fortifications that russia has dug in um late last year that are just so difficult for ukraine to breach at the moment mm -hmm. ironically so your 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 money is that putin putin hangs in there for a while um, at the moment um I mean, we've seen a lot of legislation go forward that is intended to help Russia fight a long war. Um, we don't see, I mean, a couple of deputies vo voted against it, but there's no real voices of dissent at the moment. I mean, Yandex's uh, owner, who's living abroad now, spoke out against the war. I think he's the second, uh, you know, Russian oligarch to do so. There's not enough signals that Putin's support is really cracking that much what we've seen is that his way of divide and conquering and uh ruling internally um was shown by the wagner mutiny to be a very dangerous way to keep hold on power and so perhaps that will change Alyssa de carbonel it's really been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, i know i went over time but i appreciate all the views and there there it's a conversation that i think you and i could probably carry on for another hour or two but um, and I hope we we can do so in the future again, that we can talk to you again. And it's great, great to meet you on Zoom. Yes, thank you so much. Very wide-ranging conversation there. Thanks, Alyssa.